We struggle with this decision a lot about which product do you choose and if there's a third product, how will you select for that third product? And we've treated patients north of age 80 with all of the with all of these products. And I think it's, it's a select group though. This is not the typical 80 year old patient that comes in the clinic in the wheelchair who's having trouble getting up and caring for themselves. These are all very fit older patients. So the data set that shows older patients may do better, it's possible that might be a little bit of selection of the right older patients. And, and it could be some of the biology you mentioned, but it may be other factors. But I think one of the take home points that uh, we like to stress is that CAR T cell eligibility is different than transplant eligibility. And there are a number of older patients who might not have gone for autologous transplant because of concerns about ability to tolerate that who may be able to tolerate CAR T cell therapy. But I think there's also an important difference. When we talk about transplant, we won't transplant patients unless they're essentially in a complete remission, yeah. right? So th this is really one of the big dilemmas on the, on the cellular immunotherapy service. You're, not, you're getting patients that are actively trying to basically die from, you know, because of their disease. It's just, it's, it's, it, and, and you're trying to often just keep them alive to get a product back to be able to treat them. And so it's way different than the typical uh, transplant arena where these people are responding to their therapy to be eligible uh, uh, for transplant. But I think we've really seen encouraging results from the, uh, from the, the real world data in both of these agents. And we're seeing treatment of patients who don't who would not have qualified for the clinical trials. And, and I guess thus far, I, I'm always instructed by there's any major uh, differences that are predicting outcome in, in these real world patients? Um, so, so in our series, uh, actually patients who fell into the ineligible ca category actually didn't do as well as the patients who fell into the eligible category in terms of long-term progression-free survival and overall survival. Um, and, um, you know, but, but they still did way better than what was predicted by Scholar 1. So, you know, it's still the best thing we have for those patients. Um, the other things that came out of our analyses were um, things that we've talked about before, but tumor volume in terms of response rate, but then also high pretreatment CRP. So patients who had a CRP that was greater than 30, they had incredibly discrepant um, uh, durability of response, progression-free survival, and overall survival compared to patients who had a lower CRP at the time of, of um, T cell infusion. So and they often had greater CRS, uh, mm -hmm. from what I remember as well. Yeah. So, Fred, do you have to have CRS to, to get a response? No, so there's a, an interesting abstract uh, here, uh, again, from our, our real, wor real world uh, data set, standard of care treated patients. And uh, Miriam Jacobs uh, uh, presented that, that abstract. Uh, and what we looked at is patients who did not develop cytokine release syndrome. And of course, the way cytokine release syndrome is defined is if you have a fever, you have grade one cytokine release syndrome. So, so in, with access cell treated patients, that's uh, between 80 to 90 percent of patients that will develop at least a fever and cytokine release syndrome. And, and we found 25 patients out of the almost 300 patient data set that, that uh, did not develop a fever after access cell treatment. And in fact, their, their outcomes were uh, not different than patients who did develop CRS. So the notion that, including uh, both response rate and uh, progression-free survival and overall survival, so the, the notion that a patient who uh, hasn't had a fever after treatment with AxiCell is, is somehow you know, doomed uh, to have a relapse is, is actually not the case based upon our, our real-world data set. And then the other thing I'd add about our, to complement what Karen said about the, the real-world data or the standard of care data, there, there are features that, that do seem to uh, predict for worse outcomes. We, we analyzed the data not by eligibility of Zuma 1, but actually broke down into all the individual characteristics that would have made them ineligible for the Zuma 1 trial. And we found uh, very similar findings, but again, ECOG performance status being two or higher was highly predictive of a worse outcome. Uh, a high LDH, so a marker for worse disease and disease burden, these are the features that, that seem to associate both with worse progression-free survival and higher uh, toxicity rates. And so but I think this abstract is very important because we have patients that get very nervous if they're not getting a fever. Is, is it working? And is, you know, we sometimes kind of root for a little bit of fever because it says that there's some expansion of the cells or something happening. So I think this data is very important to say that if you don't get a CRS, that's okay, don't panic, just. Yeah. So just, just a practical question about that. So we generally administer axicaptogene seleucil in the hospital yeah. and we keep people hospitalized for about seven days. 
if you have somebody that does not have any fever over seven days, I mean, do you still keep them in the hospital the whole time? Or are you, hmm. we, we usually discharge them around day eight. Yeah. And then I've had people readmitted on day nine yeah. with fevers yeah. and you know, neurotox. But I mean, what do you do practically? So practically, uh, we admit all our patients who are getting axicaptogene cellulosal. Uh, and uh, we keep them in the hospital for at least five days. We have had uh, rare cases, and we've treated over 300 patients with CAR T-cell therapy. We've had rare cases where a patient was discharged uh, at five or six days and then came in with a fever, or more commonly, neurologic toxicities, which often happens later. But um, uh, in, in general, uh, axicaptogene cellulose leads to high rates of cytokine release syndrome, 80 to 90 percent, and these are patients with fever and generally neutropenic because they've received fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, and so really that's a patient you need to rule out sepsis and other issues, and, and it's not, it, they don't feel well when you have a 41 degree Celsius fever, so they really need uh, uh, aggressive supportive care and, um, you know, the average day of onset of the cytokine release syndrome with axicel and lymphoma is basically within a day, a day and a half. So. so, but I would say that you know, even though the rates of cytokine release syndrome are 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 really quite high, um, many of the patients just have a fever, right? So they just have a fever that lasts for, and so those may also be patients that you could consider treating as a as an outpatient. But I think what we need to do Whoa. is we need we, well we need we need to con we need to figure out a, sort of a composite of bi of biomarkers to follow for these patients that goes into some pretreatment characteristics, and then and so that may mean that we it, you know companies that can figure out sort of point of care testing where we can get real time um, information about CAR T cell expansion in our commercial patients. Patients, as well as cytokine, as well as uh, you know the, the rate of increase in some of our key cytokine levels, that that may come into play. I'm not saying right now. <laughs> I just worry <laughs> about a neutropenic yeah, yeah. fever patient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right. and, and other. Well, we causes. do something yeah. different probably than you. We give all of our patients GCSF, so their their window of neutropenia is actually uh, quite small. Another area of yeah. potential <laughs> controversy. Yeah, we, but I agree with Karen. This also be product specific. I think that the idea for outpatient administration and even outpatient management of fever is something that's controversial, but it potentially could be done, and especially with different constructs, maybe more common as we go on.